So the state's adoption of intrusive technology and threats to democracy, it's a really daunting kind of a mouthful. It's a long sentence. And what's scary is that how true each and every bit of it is. Uh, among the sadder stories of last year, there have been plenty of bad stories that came our way in 2021. But one really sad story has been the sharp decline in democratic values in India. And as kind of actually calculated by people on the outside watching in, you have Freedom House, which declared India as partly free. We had VDEM, the respected Swedish institute, which called India an electoral autocracy now. So they didn't even did away with the word democracy. Uh, international idea of which India is a founding member ranked India's freedoms currently at the same level at which they were in 1975 which is when a formal emergency was in place. But amidst all this bad news, one kind of creeping news, which really did not make it as much as it should have, was the fact that there was another index which said very clearly that India, the world's largest democracy, is also among the biggest surveillance states. The country ranks behind only Russia and China when it comes to surveilling its citizens. And this was something that you don't normally kind of expect because a lot of us kind of go by the open, raucous, vibrant democracy phases, phases that are used uh, so uh, uh, insistently, casually and warmly. But it actually uh, conceals a great kind of a surveillance that's going on now, which it's really important to get a grip on. So my hypothesis is really to look at this whole creeping up surveillance, uh, particularly through various kinds of technologies and laws that India is using in three different categories. So I wish to kind of talk about first what I term as big fish surveillance, number two, the small fish surveillance, and number three, the real dark mode. So it just kind of, I think, teases out the, the big S word of surveillance. And I hope to be able to uh, make some sense of this in my session today. Uh, as far as big fish surveillance goes, you have to just look as far as the, the results of a, of a global wide investigation, the Pegasus project, that spoke of the use, the pervasive, invasive use of Pegasus and Israeli cyber weapon. It's a weapon. It's a cyber weapon, spyware, which is sold only to governments and India figures high in the list of its application, according to this international investigation. We must always remember that the Indian government has never denied using Pegasus. There are no investigations it has ever put in place ever since this issue came to light in 2019. So effectively, they've never said, no, we're not using Pegasus or it's wrong to use Pegasus. So the first of my three issues the big fish surveillance and its impact on democracy has to do with how Pegasus has been used. There's a wide cast of characters over whom this cyber weapon has been deployed. It consists of election commissioners, a Supreme Court judge, top heads of political parties, an election strategist, uh, enforcement directorate officials, um, uh, CBI heads, uh, journalists, uh, uh, NGOs, doctors, epidemiologists, you, uh, lawyers, you name it, a whole cast of characters. The first thing where surveillance, I think, damages democracy, and we need to pay attention to this, is political players. It transpired that through Pegasus, uh, political players, the foremost opponent of the BJP, the Congress party's uh, former president, MP Rahul Gandhi, two of his phones, and uh, phones of five others in the social circle who are not in public life, who are on the snoop list. A leading election opposition strategist, Prashant Kishore, was there. In Karnataka, phones used by senior members of the Janta Dal S and the Congress government, and their aides were likely hacked by a head of the BJP ending up toppling the government. In Assam, two important political figures opposed to the controversial Citizenship Amendment Act had their numbers on the list for possible use. So what does that do when important political players or participants in democracy are being ostensibly surveilled and their phones have been hacked by this uh, weapons grade uh, uh, spyware? Well, it destroys the level playing field, which is the basis of democracy. It gives the ruling party a symmetric amount of information and direct intelligence on its political rivals. So there is no sense of equality between people who are going to polls, which destroys a basic premise of liberal democracy. Let's look at the second cast of characters Pegasus decided to uh, be deployed on. And these are independent institutions. What is a democracy? 
but for independent autonomous institutions, which kind of are the bulwarks of it all, which make the system work. We had the story of an election commissioner who at that time was on course to be the next chief of the election commission of India. And we found that he was on the Pegasus snoop list. He was the only one of the three in the commission at the time in 2019, who found certain statements by the prime minister during the 2019 general election campaign as violative of the model code of conduct. He was under Pegasus. The journalist who reported on the commissioner's objections and made this information public was on the snoop list, as was a member of civil society, a prominent election watchdog, who is known to not think, take things lying down. So these three kind of characters who intimately had to do with the business of running autonomous elections were on the Pegasus list. But wait, we found that one Supreme Court judges, a sitting Supreme Court judge's number was on that list. A former chief justice of India was, uh, was uh, plagued by charges of sexual harassment and the Supreme Court staffer who leveled those objections, uh, people connected to her, 11 numbers of people connected to her were on the surveillance list. And lo and behold, by a very, very deep coincidence, after this sexual harassment case was put away under somewhat uh, strange circumstances, the chief justice went on to give uh, decisions that seemed to be all pro-executive. It just happens that they were. Uh, it was the Ayodhya judgment, the fate of election laws relating to electoral bonds, the Rafael fighter jet deal, and Kashmir's habeas corpus cases. And then after four months, this Chief Justice of India becomes a nominated Rajya Sabha MP. There were others on this list, they, which consisted of top honchos of the CBI. There was a war in the CBI going on at that time, a kind of an interagency war which had political connotations. Uh, an enforcement directorate official who was looking at very sensitive cases, a whole list of police officers who were manning controversial and political cases were on this Pegasus list. What does that do? What that does, if the first of going after political players hacks into the level playing field, this of course does that, but it also provides government with masses amount of private information, a lot of private personal information about these people that exists, which they can use to blackmail, bully, and target those who are heading the independent institutions. I mean, just as an example, one of the people being surveilled, a fairly independent-minded, supposedly at that time, an enforcement directorate official, has just taken VRS. In fact, his whole family was under surveillance, but he's just taken VRS, and he's said to be contemplating, contesting on a BJP ticket in the forthcoming UP polls, an enforcement directed official handling some of the most high, uh, high fi cases, most high profile cases. The third is of independent journalists, academics, NGOs, and other civil, civil society agents under surveillance. This is not very simple at all, because what is a democracy but for NGOs, independent people who come, who are not possibly parts of formal structures or pillars of democracy, but they are part of very important voices and conveyor belts. They are people who convey information from bottom up, who keep vital feedback loops in a democracy alive. And once they are under surveillance, if Gagandeep Kang is under surveillance, if independent journalists, editors of independent portals, other journalists uh, making uh, important points and who are dissenters who do not necessarily just take a pro-government line, if they are under surveillance, what do you do? You push the chilling effect or comes in, creeps in. And number two, again, information gathered about their personal lives, about their private lives can be used in ways in which they can be, uh, you know, they can be compromised, they can be bullied and blackmailed. I'll just give you one example about a Moroccan historian called Mati Munjib. He was targeted using Pegasus. This has also been unveiled by the same international um, consortium, which are called Project Pegasus. Uh, what agencies in Morocco did was gathered enough evidence about his private life over a year. And then armed intelligence agents raided his home at 9 a.m. one morning and found him and a female friend in the bedroom together. They stripped him naked, arrested him for adultery, which is a crime in Morocco, and he spent 10 months in a Casablanca prison. So what you do is you're able to render private personal information and in such a way use it to completely render important vital players of democracy voiceless. So in this sort of big fish surveillance that this government has never denied be undertaking on all these people renders the level playing field inactive, 
what it does is compromise or have the capacity to compromise independent institutions which make which are really the nuts and bolts of a functioning democracy they render them inoperational and number three absolutely shall we say throttles independent voices and gets people uh, who are important civil society uh, participants activists doctors etc silences them either by scaring them as you know that they're being surveilled or finds out so much about them that you're able to choke their voices and fundamentally compromise democracy. That's your big fish surveillance field. A second thing which this government has been doing has been the small fish surveillance. I call this small fish because it's not as if the people they're surveilling are small, but people generally, you know, what have I done, which is, uh, you know, why should I? I've gone for a movie. I've had a pizza. These are my habits. It's my sexual orientation. This is who I vote for. How does it matter if it gets anonymized and used? Well, we know what surveillance big tech has been up to. It surveils and snoops on ordinary citizens. It gathers all kinds of data on its users, their views, location, political and sexual orientation, their weaknesses, strengths, massive data is at their command. So while I think I have nothing to hide, taken together, the summation of all this information from anonymous people, from just the ordinary you know, a voter, citizen of India, that big tech gathers, it has huge potential to allow them to, uh, uh, you know, uh, put out personalized political ads to essentially divide the electorate, to divide them and therefore subvert democracy. Because you polarize people by personalizing things, you destroy the basics of democracy. There's a lot that has been written on this and it's clearly a well-established fact that big tech is able to do that. But where does the Indian government come into all this? Well. What the Indian government has done is contrary to what governments in Europe are doing, even in the USA, what governments are doing, there's no clear relationship of accountability that is being demanded of big tech. There is a very neat carrot and stick, a sort of passive aggressive relationship with uh, big tech. So you kind of have the IT rules where you are mounting this, uh, that there is all this pressure on big tech to conform. But what you also do is make clear that you'll be okay if, uh, you know, maybe data is shared with them. These are unknown backroom deals that governments may be having with big tech because of this policy. And I say this not because I charge a big conspiracy of the central government being in cahoots with big tech, but, you know, the, the Wall Street Journal, N number of reports have come in which speak of how particularly Facebook, the behemoth among big tech, has been quite kind on the BJP and on the ruling party and has allowed a lot of their posts, even if they violate a lot of things that Facebook follows online, which it says it follows in other countries and certainly in the USA, but they've allowed them to be on. So they've been kinder to the BJP even by the looks of it, by open available data would suggest that. And we have no idea about what the backroom deal is at the back of all this. Is it to allow big tech to make money while they are kind of just dealt with in this, uh, with the help of IT rules? And so the government is able to combine all the data that it gets from big tech along with new rules it has now put in place, which is of linking Aadhaar with your voter ID and a personal data protection bill, which only protects governments and not the average citizen. It just allows government to be immune from uh, all regulation on how personal data is collected. So by gathering masses of bytes of data of these small fish, it is able to actually make sense of the electorate in the way it wants to and slice and dice it and potentially be a threat to democracy in ways that we cannot even imagine now. If it has the entire data set from big tech and from its own recently really prohibitive and narrowing rules such as uh, tying up election Aadhaar with the voter ID, then you have a case of surveillance, which completely just, it's, it's almost as if the hatch is just closing in on you. So though small people, small people think that uh, their data doesn't matter, but all of this put together gives people who are collecting this, surveilling this, an enormous amount of control and a hold on who they are governing. And there is no question of a level playing field. It distorts democracy beyond comprehension. The third, what I'd like to believe, the third way in which government is going around using surveillance to damage is probably the most sort of, um, is probably the scariest. And uh, it's, uh, it's half proven, 
but you just have to look at whatever is available in public domain and how it's being handled to get very scared and very worried about it. Uh, this is what I call the dark mode uh, way, the third way in which surveillance is being used to kind of distort democracy. The Bhima Korigao case, the BKC case, the BK16 as they were called, and then the BK15 after uh, the 87-year-old Jesuit priest died, there are BK15. This is almost like the canary in the coal mine of India's democracy. And we should really care about how that canary is doing. The canary in the coal mine is often the canary in the coal mine, which if it starts feeling ill, earlier people would go and pump in more oxygen to improve the quality of oxygen in the shaft. That was the idea that you use the canary in the coal mine to tell you about the, the health and the, 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 you know, the wholesomeness of the, of the mine. And we should really worry about BKC, about lawyers, academics, priests, dissenters, authors being in jail uh, for more than two years, uh, two years in a lot of cases, without the trial even starting. But what do, so this is just another case, but what do several of them and their lawyers have in common? Well, they were surveilled via Pegasus before their arrests. At that time, when their names came forward, when some of their lawyers' names came forward, they were just, you know, ordinary lawyers in, you know, in small towns. But it so transpires now that Pegasus was on their phones before they were arrested. And the darker side, which is what really makes this kind of surveillance dark mode, is what the Washington Post reported in February this year the 10 letters had been deposited on the laptop by a clearly a powerful hacker on the laptop of Rona Wilson, a Delhi-based rights activist. And then another 22 sets of documents were loaded on his laptop. It was established by Arsenal, a digital forensics firm, which is based in Massachusetts, USA, a respectable firm. It has actually looked at two reports and it has concluded that Files were planted on the laptop of Rona Wilson, and it is on the basis of those very files planted, it would appear, that Rona Wilson is serving a jail sentence and under the most stringent laws of India. So we don't really know because the matter is still to be heard in the Mumbai High Court and there have been two appeals. I think there's not been a substantive hearing of the matter. But to think that it's not just surveillance, but somebody, some very powerful hacker, has been able to deposit 32 files on the laptop of Rona Wilson. And uh, there he is behind bars and for a long time and under the most stringent kind of laws. So other than losing this time, we've lost Rona Wilson, we've lost 14 of these people as being symbols of people who comment on uh, democracy, who take positions on democracy, who are articulate, who can see things, who are not known to be supporters of government being put out of action. So that's one way in which surveillance can go in and directly attack democratic rights of people, their rights, but beyond BK15, this, this speaks for all of us for 1.4 billion for whose rights these people have stood for. So I think the kind of scenario that in India we worry about now about surveillance and how state surveillance through use of intrusive technology is kind of marriage with laws and its own data collection, its treatment of big tech, poses a severe challenge to India. So while you have the sort of Turkish um, business, what Turkey, Turkey does with its um, uh, internet, we have Russia doing its own little, it has its own little room in how it functions. We have China, the Chinese firewall is discussed. But I think India's very sophisticated and very dark uh, surveillance scenario should leave us all worried because it's all happening in the name of democracy, in the happening of laws that are clearing parliament. And uh, it damages democracy in ways that we can no longer say that, uh, how does it matter? As apparently the, the Google founder, Eric Schmidt, once uh, sort of almost mocking at people who worry about privacy said that if you don't want people to find out that you need not be, you know, you shouldn't be doing something or words to that effect. Well, as somebody said that most people who say things like, um, it doesn't matter what I do is all in the open, why should I care? But then the same people get very worried when I ask them to take all their clothes off. So I think to not recognize what is private, what is personal, uh, would be to ignore one of the biggest perils on India's democracy. It's a long shadow. And uh, we need to really be vigilant. And the first step towards being vigilant about it and being able to roll it back is to be really to really understand how it's not just someone else's phone that's being hacked. It's not just Facebook, some random information that's going out. All of this added together, the surveillance on big fish, 
surveillance on small fish and dark mode surveillance ought to concern us a lot. <laughs>